Servus. <lacht> Geht's euch gut? Ja. Doch. Das wäre mal ändern. Cheap Suit Serenaders. I'm gonna get it. Und auf der Rückseite sind wunderbare Zeichnungen von Robert. I'm gonna get it. <lacht> get it, Robert.
Das wird doch, das wird doch was gehört. Ja, herzlich willkommen, liebes Publikum. Okay. Ja, also, herzlich willkommen, liebes Publikum, wir wollen noch gar nicht lange reden. Jetzt kommt gleich einer der Highlights des diesjährigen Comic Festivals in München. Wir freuen uns, dass wir im Amerika-Haus sein dürfen in diesem prachtvollen Saal. Wir möchten uns darauf hinweisen, hier im Hause gibt es eine ganz tolle Ausstellung, A Tribute to Robert Trump. 80 Zeichner, über 80 Zeichner haben dem Meister des Underground Comics ihren Tribute gezollt. Einige davon, gar nicht so wenige davon, wie ich erst gesehen habe, sind hier anwesend. Vielen Dank auch für euren Beitrag. Ohne euch würde es das alles auch nicht geben. Ja, genau. Wir bedanken uns bei den Sons of the Desert. Ich hatte eigentlich nur zwei Stücke bestellt, aber ich muss sagen, ich habe auch den Eindruck, der ganze Saal war so überwältigt, dass wir uns auch schon für die Zugabe haben. Ein paar organisatorische Dinge während des Gesprächs. Bitte keine, keine Blitzfotografie. Und im Anschluss an das Gespräch äh, wird Robert Kram direkt äh, den Saal verlassen. Es wird keine Signing-Session geben, denn wir haben danach noch den Peng-Preis. Da werden auch die Sons of the Desert spielen. Wir machen dann vorher noch eine kleine Erfrischungspause, dass ihr eben da draußen vielleicht einen Augenblick unterhalten könnt. Und ja, fangen wir auch gleich an, oder Michael? Ja, eigentlich hast du alles gesagt, was ich auch sagen wollte. Ja, das auch äh, mal was. was man noch sagen könnte, Robert Kramp gibt während dem Comic Festival insgesamt keine Signing Sessions, also bitte großen Respekt. Gilbert Shelton wird aber morgen äh, im alten Rathaus signieren. Also Steff, sorry, wir müssen umdisponieren. Ja, Gilbert war das am Samstag ein bisschen zu stressig, aber äh, Gilbert ist morgen an deinem Stand um 11 Uhr. Äh, stell dich drauf ein und stellt euch auch drauf ein. Am 11 bis 1 signiert Gilbert Shelton im alten Rathaus. Und äh, was haben wir noch im Angebot? Ach ja, trotzdem für die Leute, die Robert, von Robert Kramp ein Autogramm haben wollen. Ähm, Robert Kramp war so freundlich, dass er uns äh, 400 Drucke signiert hat. Und äh, eben jeden Tag gibt es die Möglichkeit, äh, 100 Drucke zu bekommen bei uns. Ähm, die ersten 100 Leute, die jeden Tag eben den Kramp Tribute Band kaufen, kriegen den signierten Druck von Robert Kramp gratis dazu. Ansonsten denke ich, ja, soll ja, man jetzt den Abend genießen. Gell? Ja, bleibt uns nur noch unsere Gäste zu begrüßen und auf genau. die zu bitten. Entschuldigung, was ist mit Gerhard Seifried? Ja. ja, der ist ja auch da, der sitzt genau. ja hier vorne. Der wird auch signieren. Gerhard, signierst du nochmal? Kann man dich für eine Signieraktion einplanen? In Grenzen. In Grenzen. <lacht> okay, aber morgen eine Stunde. Gibt eine Uhrzeit. Wann wäre es am liebsten? Nicht nach Hamburg. Mit Gilbert zusammen vielleicht. Okay, okay, okay also Gerhard Seifried signiert morgen auf um 11 Uhr im Alten Rathaus. <lacht> Ja, dann begrüßen wir unsere Gäste, Mr. Robert Trump. Gerhard Seifried. Ja, 
blinding lights makes it they're all black out there, can't see anybody, which yeah. is nice. <laughs> Less self-conscious, you know. Not that I hate people, but <laughs> Nobody's in charge. This is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so what should we talk about? Well, thank you for beginning. That's <laughs> 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 We've got an hour up here. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Get into an argument. Yeah, like well, we all agree on everything. What we argue. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> Let, let's get the band to play some more songs. <laughs> uh, it's time for another tune. <laughs> uh, well, I can say, I can say how amazed I am to sit here. Uh, little head I saw about that. For some 40 years ago here in Munich. And then, I'm going to sit here with the two artists that influenced me most and that I liked most back in those days. So that's pretty amazing for me. Well, gosh. <laughs> yeah, I'll say something <laughs> Yeah, okay. And, uh, that was good with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll talk about Gerd Seinfried. Uh, I, I met Gerd in the late 70s, he came to San Francisco and drew some pages for Anarchy Comics with uh, Paul Mavridis and Jay Kinney. And then he uh, came to my publishing company, Ripoff Press, and he <laughs> drew some pages for the fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. <laughs> and it, at the time, in America, we didn't know anything about it anything in Germany. Uh, Americans don't know anything about anything that happens outside of America. <laughs> but, uh, now, now I know what a great cartoonist Seyfried is. Uh, oh, he's never been translated into English, unfortunately. He, his comic strips are so much about Germany that we can't understand them. It's German politicians, German television. It, it's Unfortunate, but uh, it, he's done some things that could be translated, but they haven't been translated. <coughs> well, well, I might say a few words about how I got to San Francisco in the first place, since it was by accident. <laughs> when my first book came out, uh, Wo soll das alles enden? Uh, I've got a some advance money from the publisher's old book back then and I decided to fly to the States, not knowing anyone there. So I took a plane to New York City and hoped for the best. And the plane, unfortunately, late in the evening, had to circle over New York City for an hour and it was like city lights as far as the eye could reach, so I was yeah. very afraid <laughs> and didn't dare leaving the airport. <laughs> <laughs> it was full of fear. Well, and good, I with good reason. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat there at the airport in New York City and couldn't go, go back to Germany because of the loss of face involved. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I decided to just fly on. Yeah? You got back with another airplane going... Yeah, I got the cheap midnight flight to San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat in this jumbo jet with two other passengers. <laughs> <laughs> and the stewardess is fed us with champagne and caviar. Uh, yeah, nice. <laughs> so they had to get rid of anyway. <laughs> and when I arrived in San Francisco, it was, just, it was sun up and it was flowers and palm trees, so the things looked better. Oh. So I mm. marched from the International Airport down to Ripoff Press. 
not knowing that there are pussies in San Francisco, <laughs> <laughs> which took me some five hours. They found a group of friends and met Jay Kinney and uh, Paul Mafridis there and said, I'm a German cartoonist, and I sat on the sofa and fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> that was the beginning there. He woke me up a couple of hours later to have a hamburger. So <laughs> that's, that's the introduction <laughs> of myself into San Francisco. That's that story, the truth. How come you have a different microphone from us? That's what I want to know. Uh, this is the, the cheap microphone. <laughs> you got the expensive one. Right? With the guests from America, I guess. Well, it's time for another tune. <laughs> come on, you must uh, play a number for us. <laughs> Robert, you play. Me? Well, I'll, I'll play something later. I'll do something. Yeah. It's got to be paid for you. It's got to be paid for you. Still there. Are we done yet? <laughs> Is that the witch, Chief Thrills? The Chief Janis Joplin. Yeah? yeah, Janis Joplin. The Chief Thrills album cover, as you did. Yeah? Could you tell us what, what, how, how did that happen? I mean, how did um, you how to get the job? Well, I, it was 1968, let's see, uh, a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> they, they called me up and they, um, I guess they'd seen Zap comics and everything and liked it, and they they needed a cover really fast because the the record company CBS had done a cover they didn't like. So they came over and they said, "We need this cover by tomorrow. Can you do it?" <laughs> <laughs> and I needed the money with 600 bucks, so I said, "Okay, I'll do it." So I I took some speed and stayed up all night. <laughs> <laughs> and I finished it just as the sun was coming up. They came over and they liked it. They took it and uh, got the money, and that's it. <laughs> what? Well, they, they want me to do a front and back cover. So I did the front and back cover. They didn't like the front cover, so they used the back for the front. <laughs> and they put a, a big photograph of Janice on the back. But, you know, I, I wasn't particularly crazy about the music. I just needed the money, and I I like them personally. I like Janice personally. She's nice. I liked her singing, but I didn't like the band very much. But it was, and uh, the rest is history. Sold millions of copies. I got no royalty. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not bitter. They stole the artwork, right? The artwork got stolen by somebody at the record company. I never saw it again. Later heard that it sold its soft piece for $21,000. <laughs> but that's all right. I'm not bitter. <laughs> Janice Joplin and I were students at the same time at the University of Texas. And we, we were already Robert Crumb fans. We saw Zap Number One, and uh, it, which made it made its way down to Texas somehow, I don't know. <laughs> when Janice and I were students, it was the year, years of the folk song revival. And Janice and I used to sing folk songs together at the Hootenanny every week. And Janice was the big star. Uh, she was already the star of the folk song crowd. And one day I uh, asked Janice, I said, I, I like to play rhythm and blues. How about let's doing some rhythm and blues or, or rock and roll? And Janice said, we folk artists don't do rock. <laughs> right. But she, right. changed, she changed her mind later. <laughs> but it was too late for me. Uh, she found another band. <laughs> the lure of rock and roll is too irresistible because that's where you really get worshipped like a god. 
doing rock and roll. Just doing folk music. It's small time stuff, you know. So you couldn't resist the, the lure, the seduction of doing that. And like rock, a lot of other ones. Rock stars have groupies, cartoonists. To <laughs> 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 We'd all have died of heroin overdoses long ago if we had groupies. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, old and uh, somewhat senile, but still, still go on. So. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Okay. About drawing. All right, serious question. Are you still interested in drawing? Eh, not so much. <laughs> okay, well, I didn't have a chance to ask you this before this. So, um, when you draw, you draw so many different different kinds of people. Yes. Um, do, you, um, do you find yourself becoming these people while you're drawing them? Is that how you <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sort of. Yeah, I do, kind of, yeah. It's a kind of a, um, you take on the personality when you're drawing and, and writing dialogue for a particular character, yeah. Like God? Like God. <laughs> sure, sure, God. <laughs> Where did you get all those great realistic faces that she drew in the book of Genesis? You did the begots part and all that. Yeah, so and so begot, so and so begot, so and so. I got all the different sources, old National Geographic magazines and you know, <coughs> things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Telling secrets. Right. Oh, I steal from the best, I always say. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yeah? There's three heroes of the underground comics of the 60s, yes? Reflecting on that type, what would you say is the legacy of that? Yeah, good question. What's the legacy of the underground comics? Well, one legacy is that, you know, adult comics now is like a kind of well-established medium, and, you know, people are doing graphic <coughs> novels, and comics are taken seriously. They even have, like, comic critics now, and God forbid, and all <laughs> kinds of pretentious nonsense like that. <laughs> so, and, you know, we're, we've been around several decades already, so, like, you know, the original art sells for pretty good money, and sometimes museums and galleries show the stuff, so, you know, it's, it's really different from what was in the beginning, because, the, I don't know. Jack Kirby of mainstream comics fame said he hated underground comics, but it was thanks to underground comics that he got the, the rights, the ownership of his own artwork, which he could then sell for thousands of dollars, more than he got paid for having it published. Oh yeah, way more. But he didn't, he didn't appreciate our contribution <laughs> to the industry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's a superhero <laughs> artist. Marvel Comics. He drew th thousands of pages of superhero comics of Jack Kirby. Well, it was a different beginning here in Germany for me. It was an underground comics. We had the plot, it was an underground newspaper, you could say. Yeah. A different thing. And my job yeah. was to <coughs> fill out spaces left in the text. <laughs> oh, drawings, yeah. We... Spontaneous drawings. Right, so yeah. No idea what to do with so <laughs> snakes and mushrooms and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. Well, you were probably high on drugs anyway, so it was all <laughs> <laughs> it was coming, yeah. pouring out of your imagination, I'm sure. Yeah, the drugs did it all. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Robert Crumb doesn't use drugs. No. Yeah, I quit. Well, I take, you know. Headache medicine now and then. <laughs> I stopped using, you know, mind-altering substances way back in the mid '70s. After the altered. Well, yeah. He's stoned on Bayer aspirin tonight. <laughs> <laughs> the last time I took LSD was 1973, and I decided never to take it again when I found myself down on my hands and knees puking on the ground and. I, 
a voice in my head said, you don't have to do this anymore. <laughs> I always had a hard time on LSD. It was always rough. It was never like blissful and, you know, just all sweetness and light. I had like horrible nightmare visions. And my last LSD trip, I had a vision of the future of the earth that was not warm and fuzzy at all. It was pretty horrifying. So I said never to take that stuff again. We used to take peyote, eat peyote cactus when we were students at the University of Texas. It was close to Mexico and the cactus was easily available. But peyote uh, is poisonous. Uh, it makes you high all right, but it's, first it makes you sick. But you, you get high about the same time you get sick. <laughs> and, and when you're throwing up in the to toilet, you say, Look at the great colors. <laughs> wow, the colors, man. <laughs> Peyote never agreed with me. I did it a couple times. It, it was not my friend at all. Peyote is... I've tried it only once. It made me puke, of course. And yeah. It discovered the secret of the universe. And <laughs> My stomach hurts so much. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, me too. Did, did you write the secret of the universe down? <laughs> no, I was not. <laughs> One of the Huxleys used to keep a pencil and paper by his bed in case anything occurred to him uh, important in his dreams. And one night he dreamed the secret of the universe. He wrote it down on his <laughs> paper and went back to sleep. And the next morning he looked that what he's written in it, it said, the universe is permeated with the smell of kerosene. comic of you, I like this, and it's Philip with this and it's 100,000 dream. He discovered the secret of the universe too, but he writes it down in Russian, which he can't read. <laughs> And what he wrote down was, keep on drugging. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful little comic. Hard to get, I guess. We're republishing it in French. Uh, I... But who speaks French? <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't need much translation. It's a wonderful little comic. Anyone try to get it? Oh. Maybe we'll find a German publisher uh, if, if I keep asking around and spread, spread the word. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for a... That was my first comic strip, Wonder Warthog. It was a parody of Superman. And Philbert Desmex was the Clark Kent, the alter identity of, Super, of Wonder Warthog. And Wonder Warthog was the ugliest, stinkingest superhero ever. And he, and he still is. Can you say how it was to work with Harvey Kurtzman for help, both of you? Well, he, Harvey Kurtzman was a mentor for me. I know that. Working with him was very instructive. You know, I learned a lot about the biz. You know. Correct and correct and correct and say no, it should be this way. He didn't do that, but he was... Um, he gave a lot of helpful advice, you know. He said, he said, when you're drawing, trying to be funny, just think of the guys on the corner. Think of your, the guys that hang out on the corner, are they going to think it's funny? <laughs> no. Harvey Kurtzman was not only a primary influence for all the underground cartoonists, but he was personally very helpful. He, uh, yeah. He, he made me change some things, um, but uh, um, always very polite and helpful. And he paid thirty-five dollars a page. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was almost enough to live on in the in the sixties. I guess for for those who aren't familiar with Harvey Kurtzman, he founded Mad Magazine and, as a comic book in 1952. That was turned into a magazine in 1955, and then Kurtzman quit in 56 and started Humbug Magazine, which 
a great satire humor magazine, which is very obscure. And then he just kind of, the magazine thing just failed him, and then he ended up working for Hugh Hefner for Playboy. <laughs> and Fanny, which is not, 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 not his best, earlier stuff. Best you know. stuff. He, he also did Help magazine. Yeah. That's and right. I, I did a cover for Harvey Kurtzman's Help magazine <coughs> that showed the Beatles. The Beatles were just becoming famous, and I made them... I retouched them to make them bald-headed, oh. <laughs> and, and they were singing, help, <laughs> and, and uh, that, I think that's where they got the idea for the title of their huh. second movie. <laughs> <laughs> magazine cover with the Beatles and I took a pencil eraser and erased their hair <laughs> and, and made them bald-headed. Uh, I have a question for Gilbert. Um, was Fat Freddy's cat, was it based on any particular cat? <laughs> oh, a friend of mine had a cat that looked like that. We, li we lived in no cat looks like that. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was a, he was a nasty cat. We lived in Venice, California, which doesn't have streets but canals, and it's full, full of garbage and dead fish, and it was cat heaven. Actually, I modeled Fat Freddy's cat after Cicero's cat, who is a character in the comic strip Mutt and Jeff. <laughs> which was one of my favorites, it, and it had a a human human face like uh, Cicero, who is another character in the in this comic strip, and I thought that was funny that the cat looked like its owner. So Fat Freddy's cat looks like Fat Freddy. <laughs> he has the same nose. <laughs> right. <laughs> Are we almost done yet? How much more time do we have? No! Yes! Please forgive me, it's a silly question, but I'd like to know where the word, where the name underground comics come from. That's a very silly question. It's really a misnomer, actually. Yeah, the comics weren't really underground in the literal sense of, you know, uh, <laughs> Ill, <laughs> so illegal that, that they had to hide from the law or anything like that, you know, it wasn't a true underground thing. It's just we, outside we, the mainstream. You know. The fringe. Yeah, better word, actually. We, we preferred the name alternative. That's, yeah, that sounds a little bit too intellectual, though. <laughs> <laughs> Underground is more romantic. It makes you feel like a real rebel, you know, like you're really doing something dangerous and exciting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, how did you come to translate Gilbert? Pardon? Say that how did you come to translate Gilbert? Oh, Ropu asked me or whoever it was back then. So that was not translate that so I sort of did it. <laughs> because I liked it. Feeling for it, I guess, and but the publishers kept kept sort of talking into my translations. And, but this is what where is this? And what, they had some strange things. Uh, I'm going to say that. that's really hard to say because they pissed me most of the time. But it was fun, nevertheless, to translate Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> well, Garrett speaks. Garrett speaks very good English, uh, so that helps. Harry Rovold also translated me and Robert Crumb. Yeah. And, uh, he's a character. <laughs> <laughs> What's that guy that was publishing all that stuff in Germany illegally? What was his name? Raymond Martin. Raymond Martin. Yeah. Is he here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> we gotta have a word with him about that. He did that for years, right? Well, Duke Comics has has been revived, but but without 
Raymond the Beautiful. <laughs> and he was really annoyed. He used to put out this publication where it showed this like him with like 18 beautiful naked girls it was all the time. Remember those? Yeah. Some hippie cult that he had going. And he was thrown out of the city of Nuremberg, so the rumor goes because he huh. had too much going with too many, too young girls. Right. They were, just, they were all jealous. <laughs> I was jealous, Jesus, and he wasn't even paying us. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> but he was the first one who wrote your comics, both of you. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's well, the other side. There you go. <laughs> what kind of comics do you guys read? Uh, well, whatever happens to, you know, I'm a still connoisseur of comics. I check out all the latest stuff that comes my way, and uh, I like some of it, not all of it. And now, in the, in the age of graphic novels, a lot of it's kind of pretentious and overly serious, you know, somewhat arty-farty, <laughs> but there's still good stuff, you know, done by young artists, interesting stuff coming out. Yeah. I, I read the French comics in magazines like Fluid Glacial and Psychopat and L'Echo de Savan. Uh, and there, there's some good French cartoonists, but mainly I read the comics to try to learn French. <laughs> and I've been to Russia twice and I met a lot of amazingly good Russian cartoonists nobody knows. Is that right, really? Because wow. nobody can translate them. Amazing. They're good, huh? Very good. Really? Wow. Yeah. 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 This is a Russian comic project called Respect uh, against intolerance and against racism. Oh. And it was the biggest comic event I've ever seen with thousands and thousands of spectators. Wow. Like, like Amazing. I guess 100 Incredible. artists from Russia. Yeah, really. Doing comics. Doing comics. Doing comics. Doing comics. Doing comics. Doing comics. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally amazing. Are they aware of our stuff that we've done? Did, did they ever see our stuff? Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. yeah. Due to the comic festival was yeah. huh. organized by this Russian organis vague organization of cartoonists and huh. helped by the Goethe Institute and by the yeah. British Council. Really? Yeah. How did you read it? By translators. It was good enough to look at the drawings. Yeah. A, a good comic should tell a story, even if you can't read it. So that worked with most of them. Yeah. And I've seen some amazing artwork. Really? My disguise on okay. famous and rich in the list. Yeah, yeah. I had no idea this was going on. Yeah, we were doing this. Yeah. Uh, we were in Serbia in September and yeah, there was I was surprised there was some guys doing good comics there too. Mm. In India too. India was amazing. Name any then probably. So huh? You could name any land there. I don't know. Cartoon is hidden somewhere. Maybe, yeah, maybe so. Yeah. Maybe it's I wonder if China, I wonder if there's any interesting comics being done there. Right. I haven't seen anything. It's harder to do. <laughs> <laughs> they do it upside down. <laughs> I wonder if Africa, I wonder if there's anything good coming out of there. Yeah? yeah. yeah. Africa? Yeah, I've seen good ones from South Africa and Namibia. Yeah? yeah. Really? Yeah. Namibia. Namibia. Well, there's wow. a comic called... Uh, <laughs> Mandela as, as a superman. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, not the name, but that's, it's, not, it's been a long time ago. Do you ever see the International Journal of Comics edited oh. by John Lent? No. It, it's a, a scholarly. Yeah? Hmm. Where does it originate from, do you know? Some university in, in the United States. The U.S.? Huh. Yeah, he's a Ph.D. in, in journalism whose hobby is comics. And uh, he, he publishes, 
essays and comics from all over the world. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I imagine he'll give you a pre-subscription if you ask him. <laughs> All right. I'm interested. Yeah, I would be interested in that. It was in, in, surprising in India when this comics festival in Delhi that was the second year they were putting it on. And there's these young people there doing real highly personal comics in India now. It's, just, it's a, a new phenomenon there. It hasn't existed very long, you know, personal, personalized comic books. In fact, they didn't have any comics at all until the 1960s when some guy started doing comics based on religious myths in India. And that went on for like 20 years or 25 years before people started doing more personal stuff. And there's this one guy there that we met that was going around to rural areas of India and Pakistan and <coughs> other places like that and teaching like these peasants how to tell stories using comics. And then he, he published them they were really amazing. Some of them were just short strips, maybe four or eight panels. These crudely drawn things that these people telling about their lives. They are really amazing. And yeah, interesting thing. So comics is very democratic that way, you know. You don't have to be a highly accomplished artist to tell a story with cartoons. You know, you can do something real simple. It can work. Some of the I don't know, most personal accounts that that I've read about things like the uh, bombing of Hiroshima were done by comic artists. You know, you can really tell a personal story that way. Pictures and words. And like that. Uh, the other questions? On the, on the other hand, that the bad influence of Robert Crumb on the world of comics is that he encouraged everyone to talk about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> When Robert Crumb does it, it, it it's it. But it's not interesting in 99% of it. Well, it's to be expected. 99% of any cultural medium is going to be probably pretty un uninteresting generally. Comics are very effective brainwashing. <laughs> right. <laughs> what do we think about S.J. Wilson? Is he still working? Well, he had a bad accident about five years ago. He was found laying in the street and he got brain damaged, and so he's not doing anything anymore. He, he was a big influence on on us also. He, yeah. he was the... <coughs> excuse me. He was the cartoonist that encouraged Robert Crumb to let it all hang out. Right. <laughs> that might have been a bad influence, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have let it all hang out. I'm not sure that was a great idea for voiced, you know, sordid fantasies on the world. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a moot point. <laughs> what do you think of manga comics? Me, I don't find them very interesting myself. I don't know. Is there any mainstream comic that you appreciate? No. <laughs> <laughs> None, whatever. I never like superheroes. I don't like it. Action adventure comics. Uh, I, I, I like. No, I didn't. I never like. I like funny animal comics. Yeah, I like Donald Duck and Little Lulu when I was a kid. I still like those Carl Barks Donald Ducks comics. Those are great. But I guess. But current mainstream, no. There's nothing. I'm, nothing I'm seen that I found interesting. At all. From today's perspective, what you have done, like Mr. Natural or the Fabulous Three Brothers, seems like classic comic. Uh, Would you have been intimidated at the time if somebody had told you what you are drawing today will be read still in the 90s and in the new century? Oh, we knew all that already. Posterity. <laughs> <laughs> I would go down looking and... for for a very small target group like a niche, or were you aware that you are that this is a growing a growing target group? Gee, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I started doing comics before the weekly leftist newspapers in various 
cities like uh, the Berkeley Barb in Berkeley, California, and the Los Angeles Free Press, and the East Village Other in New York, and in my hometown, the, the Rag in Austin, Texas. These were leftist newspapers that I, I was in sympathy with what they had to say, but they were really dull, I, and I <laughs> thought that they, they needed comic strips to attract <laughs> readers, so, so I invented the Freak Brothers to uh, attract <laughs> readers to... <laughs> what, you didn't like the psychedelic artwork <laughs> in those papers? <laughs> Mm, like the San Francisco Oracle, Oracle no, right. that was boring. But uh, <laughs> the spiritual flowing Art Nouveau drawings that people were doing when they were high on amphetamines. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and lectures from Timothy Leary about you know how to handle your LSD trip. That didn't interest you. <laughs> Recently, a couple months ago, I went through my collection of early underground comics and was looking at them in, you know, from the late 60s, early 70s, and I realized that 85% of them are now unreadable. <laughs> Everybody was, they're incoherent, that people were so high or stoned or whatever, I don't know, they didn't, couldn't tell a coherent story, they couldn't draw coherently, but they got published, it was kind of a fad in the early 70s. Well, the artwork, the, uh, when we were young, uh, we could spend a lot more time and energy on the artwork. And that uh, exhibition of underground art that Dennis Kitchen and James Danke put together is very impressive uh, visually. Uh, maybe uh, it's unreadable, but it looks good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you said you invented the Freak Brothers to make the, these papers funnier, but did you have live models that you that you knew that you based <laughs> the Freak Brothers upon? Did you stay with them or uh, not really? But uh, I've met dozens of guys that think they're the original Fat Freddy. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you say, tell me you based them on the Three Stooges? Uh, one night I went to see a double feature movie at the film <coughs> program. One film was the Marx Brothers and the other film was the, the Three Stooges. And I thought, well, I could, I could make a funny film with characters like that. So I made a short film uh, about the Freak Brothers and I did the first Freak Brothers comic strip as an advertisement <coughs> for this film. Oh. And, and everyone liked the advertisement better than they liked the film. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave up my idea of being a movie director. So <laughs> that film, is it the estate of an existing copy of that film? No, it, uh, it, someone lo loaned it to someone and it got lost. Oh, oh fuck, bitch. Oh. <laughs> that thing's a fucking collector's item, dude. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, it wasn't. I didn't think it was bad. Gerhard, are the Three Stooges known in Germany at all? Yes. No? No, yes? The, the, the world's stupidest com comedy. You can imagine the... the I didn't mean it, Mo! <laughs> Freak Brothers poking... Uh, uh, the Three Stooges would poke one another in the eyes. Right. And, and they carry boards on their shoulders and turn around and smack the other guys. Come on, it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> that scene where they run this big cross-cut saw across Curly's head. Ow, 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 ow. <laughs> they look at it and all the teeth are all bent. Come on, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like it better now. Why of the freaks came from Texas? Was it an alter ego from you? <laughs> oh, I, I suppose all of them. Or my alter ego, right? In including Fat Freddy's cat. Just more like the cat, anyway. The Phineas Freak. Uh, uh, I had him come from Texas. His mother was Jewish. It, she was copied from the comic strip Mama by Mel Lazarus. Hmm. Uh, Mel Lazarus never complained, maybe he never saw it. And the, 
His father was a uh, redskin, an American Indian, and uh, redskin. Is yeah. that politically incorrect? To say? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. The Indians don't like to be called Native Americans. They prefer to be called Indians. Yeah, is that right? That, that's what I hear. <coughs> that's one. They want them redskins. Well, they call us. Pale, they call us Guero, which means pale skin. <laughs> and what about the other two? The other two? Fat Freddy is, comes from a Polish family in Cleveland, Ohio, which is the world's second largest Polish city after Warsaw. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the third one, Free Will and Franklin, doesn't know where he came from. <laughs> His father seems to have been Popeye, the sailor man. <laughs> and didn't he meet his sister in the bathtub? <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't know it was his sister. <laughs> but he realized it. it in the end... Uh, uh, two hours later. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, because he had 12 brothers and sisters, uh, he, he, and he'd been gone from home a long time. When he met his sister, he didn't recognize her. You got that name, Freewheeling Franklin, from a, some outlaw motorcycle guy whose name was Freewheeling Frank, right? Isn't that right? Yeah, and that's what I called the character at first until I learned that there was a hell's angel named Freewheeling Frank, so I changed my character. Oh. <laughs> Freewheeling Franklin, so that... <coughs> Right. Free Will and Frank wouldn't come looking for me. <laughs> <laughs> come beat the shit out of me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Popeye's seems to be a plausible father for him. There's this rumor that Popeye originally had him in the can. Uh, which, is, which has been changed to spinach. To spinach. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, okay, it's, sir. Spinach doesn't make you strong, maybe him. <coughs> him doesn't make you strong either. <laughs> yeah, right. That's the thing. <laughs> Mr. Seyfried, what modern artist would you like to work together with? So, some modern artist that you most would like to um, collaborate with, maybe? One or two? I, I wish I could get Robert Crumb to draw my comics. <laughs> I wouldn't mind having Wally Wood draw my comics. And, and you, Mr. Seyfried? Pardon? What modern artists would you uh, especially like to work together with? A modern artist? Yeah, uh, young, young. I can't think of one. Young and coming. <laughs> I can't imagine that I'm working alone. I'm used to that. So right. You used to work with Siska, for example? Right. You work with Siska? Do you still? Well, Siska, that's a different sort of thing. She brought a whole bundle of new ideas just when I was fed up with having freaks running behind cops and vice versa. So we started making this space bastard Blade Runner sort of comic thing, huh. which shocked the fans. <laughs> <laughs> But created a new scene of fans for us weirdos, all of them. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's that's an exception in my case. So normally, I like to be alone. I like I like to be alone too. Alone in my room. When you when, when you have two people working on a strip together, it doesn't make it twice as easy. It, it makes it more complicated. I would say my collaborations with Aileen, that actually that's quite easy. Because you know, the comic kind of writes itself and just say, Aileen, how's your mother? And then she just goes on and on. But <laughs> 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 it worked very well with Cisco, so but I can't picture that happen again with somebody else. So. Also, I'm writing now and doing lots of other things, so. Yeah. Must be a. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Too complicated with me. It, is writing novels easier than drawing comics? Not really, but it's yeah. different. Yeah, I wouldn't think it'd be easier, no. <laughs> but it's more cerebral work. 
It's cheaper, you don't need that much paper. <laughs> right? <laughs> time when you get fed up with doing funny things all your life, so well, I have to do something serious. Yeah, I always think drawing comics is kind of a young man's game anyway, a <laughs> young, yes. young person's game. It's tough to keep that up in old age. <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of comic strips were a lot funnier at first than oh boy. later, the Peanuts. Uh, yeah, there's, a big, there's a big danger of getting into a rut drawing comics, drawing the same characters over and over and over hundreds of times. It's, you know, you can, you can get to this point where you're just drawing mindlessly, and you're falling asleep and drawing the same characters. That's <laughs> <laughs> what's happened to me. Sleep drawing gets called. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of hypnagogic drawing. But to do a daily comic strip oh. and try to be funny every day, and what that's grind. almost impossible, and very few people can do it. Yeah, it's a miracle that anybody can do it. <laughs> any, try any to draw the... comics while driving a car, but... <laughs> <laughs> does, does any one of the three of you follow Doonesbury? No, <laughs> I don't. Yeah, Doonesbury is my favorite. He's, <laughs> Gary Trudeau is very witty, one of the few witty cartoonist. He, he's good with words. His pictures aren't that great, but uh, he's a great writer. I like Zippy the Pinhead. That's a good strip. I, I don't know how he keeps up. He can be funny after doing that strip for 30 years. I don't know how he does it. It's a miracle. I couldn't do it. I guess I'm kind of tired drawing comics. I don't know. I just want to sit around and listen to old records and fuss with my collections and stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> I've been living in France for a, for a long time. Do you still follow what's happening in the United States? And yes, I do. Politics and society? Yeah, I do. I follow it closely. I read a lot. I do a lot of reading. About, well, it's very depressing, but sometimes I think it might be better not to know, but I have a morbid fascination with watching America Self-destruct. Instagram. Fifty Nick Pearls paid your drawings with records. Seventy-eight Nick Pearls had as a greatest collection in the world. Well, yeah, he yeah. Tra traded me seventy-eights for the artwork. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had good seventy-eights, good blues records. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I still trade artwork for seventy-eights. And do drawings for CD reissues in exchange for old records. <laughs> My wife complains about it. Says, "Come on, we gotta get some money coming in here. And it's just, <laughs> all you get is just get nothing but records for your art." <laughs> I got a black patty thrown by St. Collins. <laughs> what? A black patty? What? Are you joking? <laughs> no, he's a liar. <laughs> Gotta be joking. Uh, that's pretty good, that's pretty good. You have covered some deep philosophical topics in your work. You have made Philip K. Dick comics, French philosophers, the Bible. I wonder whether something like this is coming next. I don't know. I don't like to talk about what I'm doing next. <laughs> I might not be doing anything next. <laughs> if you talk about it, it dissipates the energy and the motivation to do it. Don't you think so? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> are there any contemporary movies that you find interesting or inspiring or not really find most boring? Movies? Me? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I like some movies that come out. I you know, uh, thought Lincoln was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Well done. For a while, I didn't like movies. I considered them pictures that run away while you, while you try to see them. <laughs> <laughs> I like some of those series that are make, made for TV. Some of those are pretty good. Like the wire was good, Deadwood I thought was good. Yeah, yeah those, those are good. Some of them. Weeds, weed. Weed. What a good series. Yeah, yeah. I didn't see that. Pretty good. <laughs>
Give to 